Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Amplify Your Business. Today, we're going to be talking construction. We're going to be talking food. We're going to be talking all sorts of entrepreneurial adventures with Nicole Mato. She is the founder of Uni and CEO of Rivet Construction. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Okay, so right off the hop, I always like to ask one question, and that is, what are three things that you think every entrepreneur needs to know? Um, I would say the first one would be um, they need to know how to have a thick skin because uh, they're <laughs> gonna um, they're gonna hear no a lot or they're gonna fail a lot, and those are gonna be their biggest learnings. Um, as long as they take them that way, they're gonna yep. need to know how to have tenacity because. Um, Again, they're going to have to push through because, um, again, every time they hear those no's, they need to learn through them and they need to, you know, find a way. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think the other shocking thing, I think, is uh, a woman entrepreneur, what I would say that you don't probably hear a lot is that they need to know to how, how to have vulnerability, um, mm. because I think that it can be a hard, lonely job and by having vulnerability and talking to other people, it makes you stronger and being honest and real about what you are going through and what it's like and talking to other people. Um, they'll share with you and you'll learn from that. And yeah. Love it. And I mean, that's exactly what we try to do with this show is we try to, you know, uncover some of those challenges and, and um, you know, just the, the struggles that we have as entrepreneurs so we can connect and relate together because oftentimes we definitely can feel isolated and we can feel that nobody else is going through the same kind of struggles that we are. In reality, we're all struggling as entrepreneurs. Um, and nothing is ever as rosy as what it looks like from the outside looking in, because we are very good at making sure that we are, you know, portraying a really a good appearance, I suppose, because we're trying to, in the marketplace, build that trust. And you can't be, you know, looking like you're floundering. Uh, you have to kind of hide some of that when there are those tough moments anyway in your business. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. And the reality is, is you talk to people and everybody's had those hard, hard days, right? So, oh, completely. I don't know if I go through a week without uh, one of those hard days. I tell you that. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so now tell me a little bit about Uni first, uh, because that's how we met. We met at a uh, launch party uh, earlier this year. And so you were one of the companies who were pitching your business on the stage there. There was 700 people, a bunch of investors and other entrepreneurs and so on. Uh, and so you had a really unique experience there. So I want to hear more about Uni because that's a brand new company. And then I'd also love to hear a little bit about Rivet Construction too. So uh, Uni, what is it that you're doing over at Uni? Yeah, so um, well, Uni is the easiest way to describe it is it's like an online farmer's market. Uh, so different like small and medium sized local food producers can go on there and they can really quickly and easily set up their own little shops on Uni and get their food products online available for customers to buy really quick and easily. Uh, the great thing for customers, you can go to one place to Uni. It's like your farmer's market. You can. The better thing is, is you can put all of your products into one cart, do one checkout, but it's available all day, all, all the time. Mm. And we have great delivery options. We can help the uh, food merchants with, you know, picking up their products and then grouping it all together and getting it out to consumers. And so, yeah, we get all of our products and groceries local and conveniently. And I love that because one of the things that is always a challenge when we're trying to support food vendors, like, you know, like you're at a farmer's market and you discover somebody that you really love, but then if you can't get back to that farmer's market, or if you have to get, you know, the rest of your goods, the rest of the food basket from the grocery store, well, then sometimes those vendors will lose then the customer because it's like, well, it's just more convenient. I'm already going to be, you know, at the grocery store. So I'll pick up whatever it is that, um, you know, that that vendor could be selling uh, directly. And so you're combining all those into one basket, which I think is really the, the the necessary part of it and where a lot of these other um you know online marketplaces have failed I think yeah I think it's so true and like Courtney that works with me too she she also says you know going to a farmer's market is a 
fun, wonderful experience, but it's kind of an experience because, you know, the other part of it is if you have kids, you're going to end up in a lineup for the bouncy castle. You're going to be eating mini donuts. And like the reality is, is that can't be your typical grocery shopping experience. So it's an experience and it's wonderful and it's lovely. And we're never going to replace that, nor do we want to. Um, but like, you know, if we want to, our, our goal is to change how we grocery shop so yeah. that we're not grocery shopping from other countries all the time and doing all that. Like we're kind of lessening our carbon footprint and buying from and supporting our neighbors and our, like our community and yep. um, doing that, or at the very least supporting Canadians. Right. You know, so if we're going to be buying fish, knowing it's coming, coming from a Canadian and, a you know, knowing whose household you're supporting kind of thing. So yeah, and not only that, and when it comes to food, so I, I'm a farm kid, um, and so I grew up, uh, you know, producing, not, a, a, you know, market garden kind of stuff, but uh, producing food and understanding the nuanced difference between the way that other countries are actually producing food products versus how we produce it. And so there's a lot of regulations that are on farmers here where you can't apply, uh, you know, uh, particular chemicals or pesticides and so on, on your crops here in Canada. But in Mexico, that's completely legal to do that. And yet they can, we can import their product into Canada and, and other countries too. I'm not just picking on Mexico, but there's a lot of other places that have different regulations that we couldn't produce it the same way here. Uh, but for some reason, it's okay to import that with those chemicals having been used within it. And so this is one of the things that I think a lot of consumers don't understand. And so when you're buying local, you're ensuring that you're getting the highest possible standard in food production and preparation out of anywhere in the world, really. Yeah. And there's also like, I've been doing so much research, research on this as well, because the other thing is when you're buying from mass production products that have to, you know, grocery stores, they need to have mass production. They have to fill yep. a supply chain. Um, in order to do that, they have to have, you know, those farmers have to have mass crops to do that. They, they have to, the type of seeds and things that they use are very susceptible, way more susceptible to more, um, you know, older seeds and things like that, that smaller farmers typically use. Um, mm -hmm. And so they typically have to use more fertilizers, which means they're more dependent on, you know, international things that happen more dependent on things that, you know, happen with um, the economy and things like that for price changes and things like that. Whereas small to medium sized producers, they don't have that same amount of dependency on all of that. Um, so they're using more of the like heritage type seeds um, and they're using different types of growing practices to be able to manage their crops and to manage what they're growing. Um, so yeah, the, like you said, the products are just way better. And the thing is, is that you also with Uni, like you can actually see the actual like farm or the, like, for instance, yeah. you know, we have a few like kids on there, like young people that have made little shops. And so um, like there's little Sydney on there and she sells eggs and she's got, you know, a picture of her holding the chicken. And then like, she's <laughs> actually out there collecting the eggs and like, you can actually see her on her farm and her, and you actually see like what products you're getting and where it's coming from. And yeah. yeah you know that it's not some scary, you know, farm that's going to end up on some Netflix special, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's completely. So much more wholesome. Well, yeah, and it's just that connection. It's 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 the community and it's supporting local agriculture, which then also uh, increases our collective food security too, which is a big issue when we start talking about supply chain management issues that we had like through COVID and that, where there were certain things that were just, you couldn't access, you couldn't get anymore. And so having this, supporting what's being grown here uh, is really, really important. So so anyway, I, I really love what you guys have going on there. I think that you're solving a definite issue and you're coming at it in a way that is actually, I think, going to be well-received by the marketplace. And so it's really exciting. And I know you've only been at this for four months or whatever it's been, and so it's, it's still new. Um, but so far, uh, with everybody that's signing up, uh, it sounds like it's going to be a winner. Now, the other business that you've had, which has been much longer. So I think you said, yeah, 13 and a half years, Rivet Construction has been uh, in business. And so tell me a little bit about that business. <clears throat> yeah, so I started Rivet Construction back in 2009. Um, so that was 
Um, we started off as a commercial general contractor primarily so that I had been a project manager for another construction prior to that. Um, so we do um, commercial renovations, interiors. Uh, so for large offices, um, restaurants, hospitality, medical, dental. Um, over the years, we added in uh, design services. So we can do design build projects. Um, we can also do like ground up buildings. Um, recently over COVID, we acquired another construction company. So we're also able to do, we have a preventative maintenance division. So nice. we can do preventative maintenance for different um, commercial um, like tenants or buildings or things like that. Um, so, you know, we can do that for banks and different customers like that. Um, and so, yeah, we've been, that's been going on since 2009, still trucking at it. Um, we actually operate out of the same office as Uni. So, uh, big happy family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so this is the thing that I always wonder about entrepreneurs who have a business that's already running and then, uh, you know, they get another business going as well. And in this case, it's completely different than your first business. So oftentimes entrepreneurs will find adjacent kind of, uh, businesses or, or solving adjacent problems. So these are dramatically different. What motivated you to go down that road of creating something completely different? So the it started during COVID. Um, so we were we were pretty annihilated during COVID with Rivet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, construction didn't get shut down. We were considered essential service. Uh, however, we were serving restaurants, hospitality, medical, dental. Yeah. Um, so we had like, I think in one week we lost like three or $4 million with the contracts, um, wow. in one week. So, you know, we were having questions about, okay, when, are, when do we know we're done? You know, we were, we were having those questions. Um, so during that time we were wondering, like, I, or I started thinking like, what else am I going to do? I'm not just going to sit here and do nothing kind of going back to that tenacity and thick skin and, um, started brainstorming ideas. And I, you know, I thought of all these different ideas. I was taking classes with Startup Edmonton just to try to, I don't know, keep busy, I guess. Um, and I thought of a bunch of different ideas. And then it was when all these shelves were being bare. And I grew up on a farm like you. And, you know, we got, you know, we had cows. And so we got butchered our own meat and, you know, got eggs from one neighbor. And we got some like bread and stuff from other neighbors. And I thought, oh, it's not a big deal. I'll just go back to calling the farms. It doesn't matter. I should have been doing that anyway. Right. Yeah. And then realized that now that I live in the city, I actually don't know anyone to get that stuff from. And then it kind of dawned on me that this is a problem. And then that's where the idea stemmed from. And then since then, it's been like kind of this big passion of passion project, I guess, is just erupted. Um, so yeah, it's, and then Rivet got busy again. Right. So, uh, thank goodness. Uh, so yeah, it's keeping me busy, but even though they're completely two different worlds, there's still a lot of similarity in just, you know, strategy and things like that. Um, and Courtney, who's works alongside me, she, her and I actually worked on a construction project like eight years ago. So she had her own business. Um, she does handmade signs and art and has like a uh, national business as well. And we'd worked on that project years ago. And when she heard about this, she wanted to do it with me as well. Uh, so she was with the construction kind of world too, um, in a sense, in manufacturing. And so, yeah, she's alongside me. So yeah, it's it's good. <laughs> so So now how do you, as an individual, balance that between the, uh, I guess, the things that pull on your attention for launching a new business, and then, you know, Rivet, everything has gotten really busy again, right? So to be managing your existing business and and trying to keep, you know, all the balls in the air, it's difficult enough running one business now that you have to, uh, you know, split your focus uh, on uh, Uni. Is it easier because you've been down this path already once before um or is it really difficult to do i, I guess to just uh give us the <laughs> i guess yeah. the the real story here on this it's both right like yeah. some things are way easier because you've lived and you learned right so um you know i often joke 
that if there was something to learn the hard way and do wrong, I did it that way first yeah. with Rivet, <laughs> right? So yeah. um yeah, like some of the things I did so stupidly, it's not even funny. Um, so I didn't do them that way this time. Um, and some things, you know, I just knew how to do like, you know, all the background stuff about, you know, how to just get websites and domains and incorporation and, you know, all the legal stuff and all the accounting stuff and, you know, all that background stuff that doesn't sound like much, but takes a ton of time. I, I knew how to do that. And it, it just happened, not just happened, but I mean, it, it wasn't as big of a deal. Yeah. Um, so that stuff was easier. Um, other stuff. Yeah. It was super busy and pulled in other directions. So it was hard. Um, but the key is, is that one of the lessons I big lessons I've learned is a count on people and count on your connections and reach out and, and, you know, collaborate with other people and you know things like that so I mean if I didn't have Courtney if I didn't have my rivet team um you know regularly when I get overwhelmed and I've got a huge list um I'll go to my team and I'll literally be like hey guys I'm kind of overwhelmed my list is long everybody look at my list and see if there's something you can take off of it and they'll you know pick and choose through my list and all of a sudden my list is attainable right huh. um and so yeah, like you really just have to count on your people and not be a hero. Like you don't have to do everything yourself. Yeah, I've never heard anybody uh, use that approach before where it's like, here's my list. It's too big for me to manage. Can you guys pick away at it, right? Uh, and tell me what you guys can take on uh, the, to the rest of the team. And that's a, a unique. Uh, I've never heard that before. So is that something that you've modeled after, you know, reading a book or or getting some mentorship or coaching on that? Or is that just something that you've been doing uh, for a while? I, I haven't, I don't know that I've been doing it for a while. Like I think maybe just from COVID. Um, I think because we don't have a huge team and everybody is like, you know, since COVID, we learned how to operate with less people. Right. Yeah. And, and so everybody on our team tends to do so many different types of things and they're very multi- like faceted mm -hmm. people that can do a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, and they're always like, here, what else can I do? What else can I do? And I'm sometimes, um, I find it hard to like tell people like do this or do that, especially if it's not in their like core job function. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I found it, but I find that just like by nature of our company values and the people that we hire, they're really helpful people. <laughs> so I just find that the approach works because I don't feel like I'm, taking advantage of people they're kind of taking on what they feel they can take on um they feel like they can take ownership of it um so I don't know I think it works well yeah I don't know how it ha started or happened honestly I just is this the way that it is right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that's how oftentimes things go, right? Now, I, I'm also curious, I know that you are a Métis woman. And so as an Indigenous woman entrepreneur, um, you know, running a couple different businesses now, and having the 13 and a half years of experience under your belt uh, with your first business, um, what I guess would be more challenging as an Indigenous woman entrepreneur or and the flip side of that, maybe what are some of the advantages that you uh, just inherently have, if any, I guess? Um, well, I think that, like, as far as challenges, I think that maybe they're not specific just to Indigenous or just to women, but, you know, something I'm quite passionate about, and I'm, you know, on quite a few different committees and things like that is just in general, um, different, diverse people and, and marginalized people, um, you know, whether that's women, whether that's immigrants, um, whether it's a visible minority, somebody with a disability, you know, there's lots of different people. It's not just any one group, right? No. Um, but there is higher barriers to get access to the, you know, to success, I guess, or to opportunities. Um, I mean, I'm so excited though, by, because I feel like there's been so many strides forward. Like I think back to, you know, 2000, the early years of my business, 2009, 2010, 11, um, you know, stopping and having babies and then trying to break back in. Mm. Um, I remember like hiding in my garage, taking phone calls, trying to pretend like I was, you know, one of the big shot guys in, in, in the building downtown, you know, taking construction calls. Really, I had a crying baby inside, right? <laughs> um, 
but trying to act like a hot shot, right? And um, versus now, you know, I like I'm on calls all the time. Like I've been on calls recently with engineers and they're like, look at my sick kid on the couch, you know, and like showing, you know, and it's just accepted now. Like that yeah. is so cool. Like we don't have to like hide and pretend that we are parents because God forbid. Right. Um, yeah. So like, it's just like, there's so many fantastic strides going forward. Um, you know, with Rivet, we actually are certified indigenous owned business. Um, we're also certified women owned business. Um, so many big corporate companies are coming forward and like, you know, committing to trying to work with, you know, businesses to give us opportunities. You know, we're not getting handouts. We're not, they're not saying like, here, you get the work, but they're just saying, Hey, we're going to make sure that you at least get invited to bid on the projects, you know, so you actually have a chance. So things are improving. That's great. Right. Yeah. Yeah, And and it is really exciting uh, uh, just to see that evolution. And I see a lot of excitement there. Um, And, I, you know, with this podcast, as well as with my business on the marketing side, um, I bump into a lot of entrepreneurs. And so what I've been noticing over the last decade, definitely the last five years, it's really accelerated, it feels like, is a lot more entrepreneurs are women and are Indigenous. It's uh, remarkable, actually, um, how many Indigenous businesses I've uh, been bumping into. And I think it's not that I've changed the circles that I'm, you know, traveling within. I think it's just there is more and more support systems and more examples, I think, of successful entrepreneurs like yourself that other people then can relate to and they can be inspired by. So uh, speaking of inspiration, um, who or what uh, inspires you, I guess, and and allows you to keep that tenacity and and the perseverance that you were talking about at the opening of our of our conversation. Um, I I don't know that like there's any like one singular person that has been like a you know one singular person I've kind of looked up to. I mean, I think there's just so many. Um, I definitely do believe in that, like, see it to believe it kind of thing. I mean, I grew up with parents that were really hardworking. My mom, I grew up in the we didn't have, like, we grew up on a farm. It was, it was small. It was, we were poor. We literally had like mushrooms brought up in the carpet of like in our carpet in our living room. Like it was, you know, we didn't have a lot. Um, my mom was a hard worker though. Like she often was working like, you know, three jobs, you know, to make ends meet. Um, so, I mean, and then, and my extended family too, everybody was hardworking people. So that was an example set for us. Um, but then also like even just through my career, like it's been so exciting. Like I was think it was like two years ago, two or three years ago, or maybe it was right around the start of COVID or something. I remember how excited I was because I saw that in Calgary, there's these two other ladies, um, two other women, and they own and run a construction company in Calgary, a commercial construction company. Um, and they're they're bigger than Rivet. And uh, I just remember thinking how... Um, I think it's called like Laura Murphy or something like that. And like, I was just like, oh, that is so cool. And like, you know, I was kind of stalking them online for a while. And like, it's just that see it to be it. And it was like, oh, that is really cool. Yeah. Or like in same thing in Calgary, um, the owner of Virtual Gurus that Bobby Reset, you know, she's Indigenous Métis, LGBTQ woman. And like, it's just like, oh, like, <laughs> like, thank you. Like, thank you. Like, you know, like you were doing this and you're sending an example for all these people and for yourself, right? Like doing it for you. And all these people I think are just doing great things. And so, yeah, I think to see it to be, it is so important. Yeah. I I couldn't agree more. And this is the thing that I love about all the diversity that we have, you know, just in our culture to begin with, you know, the people, all the immigrants, uh, you know, from before and, and the ones that are coming now. And there's just such a vast diversity amongst our entrepreneurial uh, community here in the Edmonton region. It's really, really interesting and exciting. And and everybody is so supportive too. And that's what I, I just love. So 
love hearing and seeing those success stories. And that's part of what we, the reason why we do this show is to help hopefully inspire somebody else or to have other people hear of some of the challenges and how did this business overcome those? And, and uh, so maybe I can learn something from that and apply it into my business as well. And so uh, speaking of that, um, you had said, you know, over the course of your entrepreneurial uh, journey there with Rivet, you made lots of mistakes. And so now you, you know, not what not to do with Uni as you're, you're growing it. Um, can you share some of those big learnings that you had um, where you, you, you did make some mistakes maybe because those are sometimes the best learnings? Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, I bet you nobody would share something this embarrassing. Okay. So <laughs> Great. Oh, this is a bad one. <laughs> okay. This is a really bad one. So um, oh, hopefully I don't get totally like skinned for this one. Okay. So, <laughs> so in the, in my early years of the business and I'll, I'll use the caveat, like I had two babies in this course of period of time, yeah. but in the first few years of the business, I, I was convinced that I could take QuickBook courses and I could learn. I knew nothing about accounting <laughs> at all, like no concepts, no theory, no nothing. But I was convinced that I could take QuickBooks, learn QuickBooks, learn everything there was to know about accounting, and I could handle it all by myself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, moral of the story is I couldn't. I mean, I do, I will say I do know QuickBooks now, <laughs> but to, an, to the extent I need to, but I still don't do it. Um, so I was convinced I could do that. So trying to do it while running a construction company, hundred percent of my own. <laughs> so essentially what happened was I just didn't do it. I just didn't do accounting. I was very good at filing my receipts and keeping them very organized and pretty labeled, you know, files. And it was very organized, but nothing was inputted. Nothing was therefore filed with the CRA yeah. Yeah. for four years, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> four years, um, so that was the first big mistake because that's a big no-no, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, so then when I finally filed, um, you know, in your personal taxes, when you file your taxes and you have to pay your taxes, you just pay one tax bill and it auto goes to the federal government and the provincial government and they they take care of separating who gets what money. Yep. Well, being that I was now in my fifth year of business, when my accountant did the tax, I I got the four years of tax back taxes done by one accountant. So year five, I go to the accountant or whatever, and I haven't paid that four years because I've just completed getting it done. I go to the new accountant for year five. He completes the taxes. He gives me the paperwork. He's like, here's this whopping amount of taxes. You owe good luck. And whatever, he gives me the stuff. So I go online, whatever, and I pay the CRA everything it shows that I need to over taxes. And I think nothing of it. And I've paid everything to the federal government, to CRA, and I've paid nothing to the provincial government. And in the meantime, I've moved. <laughs> and I've never updated the provincial government with my address, not realizing you're supposed to do that because I'd been doing everything myself and I had not yeah. been going to my accountant to get my annual returns updated because I was trying to do everything myself. Is the moral of the story? Don't do that. Yeah. So. Um, a while later, I go to the bank and I go to take out, I deposit a client check and I go to do some banking. And they're like, your account is garnished. And I was like, what? <laughs> How on earth is my account garnished? I never miss a payment. I'm very good with my money. Like, what is happening? You haven't paid your provincial taxes in five years. <laughs> what do you mean? I haven't paid my taxes. Here's my receipt. I paid my taxes. And so, yeah, moral of the story is you have to pay. <laughs> For your business, you have to pay provincial and federal taxes to different people. And I learned that the very, very hard way. You know, so, you know what? Well, so what is interesting is I, I've been in business for a little over 11 years and I didn't realize that that is split because I just let my accountant deal with all that. So, so yeah. that's, uh, I wouldn't have known either. Even See, now. if you, the right thing to do is to let your accountant do things for you. Yeah. The wrong way to do things is be like, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it all. <laughs> but, I'll but save I mean, money if I do it myself. 
more. Yeah, well, that's one of the re- realities, right? When you're starting a business, you're bootstrapping, you're trying to do everything, you're trying to keep your costs low so that you can put as much money into the business as you possibly can, right? And so it's yeah. a struggle. And so you're as much as you're embarrassed by that, I can guarantee you that there are a ton of other entrepreneurs that have lived through that exact same experience. It's not something I was mortified. I was mortified. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and that's one of the things, right? It's, it's such an interesting journey that we're on uh, because we have, you know, so many things that we're supposed to understand or know, or, um, and, and there's just no way, even with lots of experience, there's no way to fully understand everything. So uh, lean on the experts, I guess, is the... Yeah, like as an entrepreneur, you shouldn't necessarily need to know how to do all your annual returns, all your GST, all of your (laughs) taxes, all of your whatever. Like that's why you have an accountant, you have a lawyer. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, completely. That was the lesson I learned very much (laughs) the hard way. Well, thanks for sharing that. As as embarrassing as you felt that that (laughs) maybe was, I I definitely appreciate it. Um, Now, if you were to go back, Uh, be able to send a letter back in time to Nicole, you know, 13 and a half years ago when you first start up Rivet, um, or at some point in your journey, it maybe doesn't have to go right to the beginning. But if you could send a letter back to your younger entrepreneurial self, what would be in that letter? Well, after that, obviously, hire a lawyer, hire an accountant, (laughs) and don't do QuickBooks um, yourself. I mean, that has to be in there. Um, it would definitely be like get involved in the community, like business yeah. community early. I feel like I waited. I felt like I needed to get established to get involved. I felt like mm-hmm. nobody wanted me there if I wasn't somebody. So yeah. I waited too long, not knowing. Um, and I, the other one would be that cash is king. Mm-hmm. Um, cash flow is king. Understand cash flow. Um, and the other one was, um, this is a big one for me, learn the difference between how personal credit, like gathering credit, um, like gathering, um, financing and getting more credit, how that is different personal versus business Mm. and that I should have got more financing and credit earlier on. Yeah. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Uh, what is the difference between, um, you know, uh, obtaining credit personally versus professionally? Yeah. So personally, um, what I've experienced is that you typically don't want to have a whole bunch of open credit um, because it looks like, you know, your debt ratios are too high and things like that. So, you you know, if you have an unused credit card, you, you know, you don't have a whole bunch of unused credit cards just sitting open. Right. Um okay. Whereas business, I thought I was like a hero. Um, I was running a multi-million dollar construction company and seven years in, I was doing it. The only credit I had was a $10,000 visa. Wow. Um, And I tell people that story and they're like, how? Yeah, that's incredible. And the reality was I was spending hours, countless hours managing, moving funds, all like moving money all the time. Um, and managing that cash flow, and what I should have been doing was getting in with um, with your business. You take as much open credit as you can whenever you can, because when you need money, you're not going to get money. Mm-hmm. And so, when you have money, you get credit, <laughs> and and then you have it for when you need cash flow. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah, I didn't learn that till like many years in. Yeah. No, and I think that's a very valuable thing to pass along to everybody who's on this call, because I think that that, and I've been in the exact same situation in this, or sorry, not the exact same situation, but in a situation in which, um, you know, cash flow was going good, everything was fine. And then you had some unexpected delays actually was what, what was in my situation where I had a really, really big customer who represented a big chunk of our, our business at the time. Um, they went from 30 day terms to 90 day terms overnight. And so we had all of this outstanding, you know, um, receivables that I was expecting to come in in 30 days when we signed them up. And they were such a large company where it was kind of like, well, if you want our business, you're going to have to deal with it. And so we had an extra 60 days there that we had to really scramble. And yeah, uh, same similar situation in the sense that I didn't have a lot of, um, you know, open credit 
um, in place for that. And so then when I went to the bank to try to get it, it took like way longer. So by the time we actually got everything in place, well, I, we finally got paid by the client anyway. So it was, uh, it was a lot of stress. You're better to go get credit when you have a whole bunch of money in the bank and you actually don't need it. Yeah. We'll apply for credit and just have it sitting there waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. Well, thank you for sharing everything with us, Nicole. Your uh, your journey has been fascinating. I think it's just so exciting and inspiring to hear of an entrepreneur who is starting something uh, from scratch that's completely different than what they have already been uh, doing in that. And it's because of a need, obviously, that you discovered. And it sounds like you have a real passion for really solving this food security kind of local buying uh, challenge that consumers have, but then also the vendors have in terms of accessing those consumers. And so um, anytime that somebody's building a marketplace, I, I, I really want to stress to our listeners that it's not easy uh, because you're building both sides of the market at the same time. And so it's a huge challenge. And for you to be undertaking that and seeing some early success, it's just uh, obviously a testament to what you have learned over the years with Rivet. So Uh, congratulations on the success you've seen so far. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me here. Yeah. So if anybody wanted to reach out to you to connect with you either personally or to, um, you know, find out more about your two businesses, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, Well, on LinkedIn. So I've got all my contact info there. um, And I, I don't check it daily. That's for certain, but I do check it regularly. Um, Or um, I think I've got contact info at uni.com and at rivetmanagement.com. So I've got contact info at both of them. Okay, awesome. Well, for those of you who are listening, if you enjoyed this episode, head over to amplifyyourbusiness.ca for all of the archived episodes. And if you are watching this, but would prefer to be listening to it, we're available on all of the major podcasting platforms. Just search Amplify Your Business and you'll find us there. Until next time, everybody have a prosperous day and thank you once again, Nicole.